Well, friends, it's, it's hard to believe that we are at the end of our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And yet here we are, chapter 16. And I hope that you have been as blessed as I have been these past six months that we have journeyed together and studied God's word given through Paul to the church in Corinth. And when we began our, our study back in January, our aim was to consider what it meant for us to be saints together. That's the word, that's the the combination of words, the phrase that Paul uses to describe the church in chapter one, verse two, saints together. What does it mean for us to be holy and set apart together as a group of believers seeking to offer testimony to the power and the glory of God given in his gospel to a world that is in desperate need of that gospel? And the the lens through which we asked that question was the church in Corinth. Because you see, they were not being saints together. They didn't look very distinct in some places from the culture that was around them. And they were divided. They were deeply divided on some issues, many of them secondary. But But Paul calls them back to faithfulness. And in doing so, he offers one of the most compelling visions of the church in the whole of the New Testament a compelling vision of who we are called to be as the people of God. Essentially, throughout this this letter, he's asking the church to wrestle with this question, what do you want to be known for? Or maybe even better asked, who does God want you to be? What does God want you to be known for? Hey, church in Corinth, when people in the marketplace are talking about you, what do you want them to think about? A lawsuit? It's bled over into public, a sexual scandal, division over leadership and economic class? Or do you want them to to consider that you're different in a godly sense? Do you want them to think about the gospel of Jesus Christ that you declare and herald over them? And what a question for us to consider today, church family, as we come to the end of this study. What do we want to be known for? What does God want us to? at Bayleaf Baptist Church to be known for. It's true that just in the time, like in the time of Corinth, we as a church, and I mean capital C church, like global church, we as a church have offered poor testimony as to who the Lord has called us to be. The American church is known for some beliefs and behaviors that don't necessarily adorn the gospel. We're known to bicker with one another over small things. We have not remained sexually pure. We found too much comfort in the power of this world and we've compromised on what God has said is good. Just in the past week, I've seen headlines of pastors getting arrested, having to step down from uh, from ministry. Those are difficult things. They grieve my heart because not only of those terrible situations, but the bad reputation that it offers or it gives to the church. How it how it takes away, diminishes the gospel of Jesus Christ instead of elevates it. But hear me, Bayleaf Baptist Church, those failures don't have to be true of us. We can strive in the power of the Spirit to offer something compelling, to be the kind of people who truly look different, who truly look set apart by God on purpose. And so here's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to to work through Paul's conclusion here in 1 Corinthians 16 and revisit some of the major characteristics, the major qualities that Paul encourages to be present among this people. I want us to see this beautiful, compelling vision of who we can be as the people of God one last time to consider how we are doing in the pursuit of being saints together. Let's look at chapter 16, and we're going to read all 24 verses of this final chapter. And here's what the word of God says. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. 
I'll visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I don't want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for For he is doing the work of the Lord, as am I. Let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit with you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has an opportunity. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers... You know that the household of Stephanus was the, the first converts in Achaia, and they've devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these, and to every fellow worker, to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence. They refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia. They send you greetings. Aquila and Prissa, together with their church and their house, they send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings, so greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. There are a lot of different threads of thought in this chapter, which is pretty standard for a conclusion in a letter like this. There's a discussion about an offering, Paul's travel plans, and some final instructions given to the church in Corinth. And while all these things may seem disconnected from the rest of the book, just miscellaneous items that that Paul's got to deal with as he comes to the end of this letter, I see all sorts of connections to the letter as a whole. See, Paul is showing us in these final interactions yet again how to live as a set-apart people. And this vision that God is is offering to us through the Apostle Paul is rooted in six characteristics that I think show up in this this final section that have also been true of the, the whole letter. And that's what I want us to do in our remaining time together, is to consider how all of these six characteristics that Paul mentions evidences in chapter 16 provide for us a compelling vision of the church that we should seek to embody as the people here at Bayleaf. That when we, when we answer the question, what is it that we want to be known for, that these six characteristics are at least a starting point for us to answer that question faithfully. Here's how Paul begins. The first characteristic he mentions is that God's people are a gathering people. They gather regularly together. As a set-apart people, we are called to faithfully gather. In verses 1 and 2 of our text, Paul speaks to the church about taking up an offering. And we'll get to the offering in just a minute. But he tells them to take this offering when they gather together on the first day of the week. And they are to take that offering just as the other churches, all the churches that Paul is interacting with, just as they are doing. In these instructions, Paul is assuming some things about the normal worship habits of the Christian church. And the primary assumption is they get together, they assemble, they worship together. And I know this seems rather obvious that we shouldn't have to address this element of our worship that we, can't, we sometimes take for granted, but it's a point that needs to be infor- reinforced in our own time because of the radical individualism that exists in our culture. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church? Well, Paul is, is directly refuting that here. It's been true of the whole, the whole testimony of, of Corinth that the people of God gather together. We need each other. We need to come together in worship. The people in Corinth were gathering together to offer a unified expression of their love and devotion to the Lord. It's not enough for us to do that individually. There's something greater about us coming together and and collectively declaring the gospel. 
They gathered together to hear from God's word as people faithfully expressed their spiritual gifts over them. They gathered together to take the Lord's Supper, hopefully in a way that brings about unity and not division. They gathered together to care for one another, express their their unity in the gospel. There are so many things the Bible calls us to do to be faithful, to be set apart that we cannot do on our own. They can only be expressed. They can only be engaged when we come together. So they did that, and they did it on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. They are gathering on the day of the week that Jesus rose from the grave. Listen, it is no accident that in the history of the church for thousands of years, God's people have gathered on Sundays. Millions and millions of Christians for generations, for thousands of years, have gathered on Sunday on purpose to celebrate the fact that Jesus, our Savior, is alive. And then that changes everything. That's what we're declaring together, church. Today, as we gather, we are remembering that we were lost in our sin, that we had no hope to be saved from that sin, eternally separated from a holy and righteous God. And yet, God looked down upon us with grace and mercy. He so loved us that he sent his one and only son to live a perfect sinless life that we could not live, to die the death that we deserved so that in his resurrection, we have the opportunity to receive eternal and abundant life. Just the fact that you have gathered today with the saints here at Bayleaf is a declaration, a celebration of the fact that Jesus is alive. That's why we gather on Sundays to celebrate that reality. There's also an element of declaration that happens in our gathering. We meet on the first day of the week on purpose to remind ourselves of what is of first importance. Now, what what does Paul say is of first importance in 1 Corinthians 15? That Jesus died, he was buried, he was raised, all in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to many witnesses. It's important for us to to make our lives, to have have moments in our lives where that reality of first importance is reinforced. Here's what I mean. I hope every morning you wake up and you spend some time with the Lord. I hope every morning you wake up and pray. I hope every morning you wake up and spend some time in the Word. That's a good discipline because it's a declaration. Hey, God, I need you today. I can't I can't do today without you. I'm I'm getting up this morning and I'm declaring, first of all, that I had this breath, I had this life because you gave it to me. And I need your spirit to help me walk through today to be the kind of set-apart Christian that you need me to be. And in the same way we do that every day, we give the first part of our day to the Lord, we also give the first part of our week to the Lord. Where we think, you know what? I got a lot of stuff coming up on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way to Saturday. And God, there is no way I can do everything that I got to do this week without your help. There's no way I can deal with those people. There's no way that I can be an encouragement. There's no way I can share the gospel faithfully. There's no way I can be the kind of father or mother or husband or wife that I need to be apart from your grace this week week. I need you to show up in my life. And so I'm coming before you on the first day of the week to say, God, I need your help. We declare that. We give the Lord the first day of the week on purpose. God's people gather. Now you may gather for meals in people's homes throughout the week, and that's wonderful, and we should definitely do that. But guard Sunday. Guard Sunday. We gather together to celebrate and declare the fullness of God's work in the gospel. God's people gather regularly. Secondly, Paul says, God's people give generously. As a set-apart people, we're called to be joyfully generous. Turn to your neighbor and say, joyfully generous. Now, the main concern of this, these first four verses that Paul is, is writing, chapter 16, is an offering that he's taking up for the church in Jerusalem. Paul is asking the church in Corinth, a church comprised mainly of Gentile Christians, to financially help the church in Jerusalem, a church that's composed mainly of Jewish Christians. Now, Paul is not only asking Corinth. He's also appealed to the churches in Galatia and Macedonia, but he wants these brothers and sisters to know 
that the church in Jerusalem is facing enormous financial hardship and that God has uniquely blessed them to be a blessing to their family of faith in a far distant land. And moreover, their willingness to help these brothers and sisters who are Jewish while they are Gentile will will tie together more intimately gospel ties between them because Jesus Christ has broken down the dividing walls of hostility that could exist between them. And so Paul says, okay, listen, here's how God's blessed you financially. And because of that, I want you to give. And here's how he asks them to give. This is really important for us as we think about being a joyfully generous people. He says, firstly, you need to give systematically. You need to give intentionally. Set aside something every week. Make a decision that whatever God entrusts to me, I'm going to set some of that aside on purpose for the sake of the Lord, for the sake of the work of the gospel. Listen, your money doesn't just go to places without you telling it where to go, right? It's amazing how we can spend money on stuff. It's amazing how it can just fly out of our bank account. Where did all that money go? Well, listen, you, we have a responsibility as stewards to, to tell our money where to go. And Paul says part of that is to systematically, intentionally set aside money for the work of the Lord. Secondly, he says, do it through the local church. And this is interesting. He didn't say store it up and then send it out individually. He says store it up, bring it whenever I come, and the church You're going to elect people from the church to go and take it to the church in Jerusalem. Because what we want this to be is a collective statement of the saints who are together at Corinth. We want the church in Jerusalem to know that the church in Corinth collectively has made a statement about their commitment to supporting the church in Jerusalem. A statement about them loving their Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is the evidence of it. So systematically or intentionally through the local church. And then finally, he says, proportionately. Proportionately. On the first day of every week, verse 2, each of you is to put something aside store it up as he may prosper, as he may prosper. What does Paul mean here? He says, listen, you don't need to give in such a way that then you are burdened and someone has to come and help you out. What the responsibility is, is to consider all that God has entrusted to you. And then from that, as you're able to meet the needs of your family, as you're able to to get food on the table, what's, what's extra? Now, there may be some sacrifice involved here, but what Could I give away as a statement to my support for the church, but also for my love for the Lord? And why would we do this? This is not the only time that that Paul talks about this offering in his letters. He picks it back up in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And here's where he writes about why we give generously. I'll begin in verse 8. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. So this is how you prove your love. You give generously. And here's why you do it. Verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by you his poverty, by his own poverty, he might become, we might become rich. So think about what Paul's saying there. When we give generously, when we give joyfully, We are making a declaration of the gospel. Think about it. Church in Corinth, you have an abundance of wealth. You have more money than you need. The church in Jerusalem is in deep deep trouble. And so we need you to, out out of your abundance of wealth, help them in their poverty. And Paul is saying when we do that, we are declaring what God has done for us in Christ. Because, friends, we were spiritually bankrupt. We had... We had no spiritual wealth at all, no righteousness to speak of, but Jesus had an abundance of wealth. More wealth, more righteousness than we could ever imagine. And here is what Jesus has done for us. Out of the abundance of his wealth of righteousness, he has poured out his righteousness, grace upon grace on us. That's the gospel. And so when we give, when we allow the, the funds, the wealth that God has given to us to be used by God to speak into other needs, we are actively declaring the gospel together as a people. God's people give generously. Thirdly, God's people encourage diligently. They encourage diligently. As a set-apart people, God's people offer refreshing 
encouraging friendships. This characteristic represents one of my favorite parts of this chapter. Doesn't it sound so good? Refreshing friendships. Oftentimes at the end of letters, Paul will list important faithful partners in the gospel who've been a blessing to him, even as he seeks to be a blessing to them. There are so many relationships, so many friendships reflected in these final words to remind us of the spiritual importance of these kind of relationships. Paul himself, he desires to go to Corinth to be a blessing to them. Verses 5 through 11. And he just doesn't want to bop in and bop out, right? What does he say in verse 7? It's my hope that it won't just be in passing. I hope to spend a lot of time with you, the Lord permits. And all you quality time people out there said, amen. It's not enough just to stop by. I'm just not going to check in and be in and out an hour. I want to spend a season with you to encourage you and to give you the opportunity to be an encouragement to me because I'm going to be going out in hard ministry and I need to remember that God has given me these friendships as well. Paul speaks specifically about the gift of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. That those men came to visit him in verse 18. And here's where we get this, this word. He says that these men coming to me in my, my moment where I am currently were refreshing. They refreshed my spirit. And what a picture of the kind of friendships that we're to have, the kind of relationships that we are to have as the people of God, both within our church and with our gospel partners around the world. We are to be friends, partners in the gospel who genuinely care for one another, who genuinely spur one another on toward greater faithfulness. Are you this kind of friend? Are you a refreshing friend? In my life, I've had all kinds of friendships, you can basically put them into two categories, refreshing friendships and draining friendships. Anybody ever had a, a draining friendship? I remember years ago, I had a friend, and every time we got together, all he wanted to do was talk about his girlfriend issues for hours. And you know, by the end of the meal, I was just done. And then he would say for the last five minutes, anything going on in your world? Anything you want to talk about? I said, brother, I just want to get out of here. I mean... <laughs> You have, you have relationships some, sometimes that steal life from you, right? That take life from you. But then I think about another relationship I have, Stephen Trammell. It's a dear friend of mine. And that brother speaks life. He just, he like, he, he seeks to splash living water on everybody he interacts with, including me. I call him up. He's a, he's a busy guy, got a lot of stuff going on, but he's never too busy to pick up the phone for me, to answer a question I have about, pastoral ministry or my personal life. And whatever it is that we talk about, he always takes time to encourage me, to, to remind me of my calling, to remind me of my salvation. He always diligent, he, on the phone, he will always pray for me. Before we leave, let's pray. And even in those moments where he has to offer correction, I feel good about it, right? It's like, it's the oddest thing, the way he's able to do it. I feel like me, after I get off the phone, I think, Stephen just took me to the woodshed, but I, I really feel good about it. Like he, he did it in such a way that it was encouraging to me. That's the kind of friend that all of us should desire to be. It's the kind of friend I want to be. I want to be the kind of friend that people run to for a word of encouragement. I want to be the kind of friend that people look forward to hearing from, that when they, they get my phone call, they're not thinking, oh, no, here comes Jared. Let me get an hour or two hours just to deal with him. Or when I get, they get a text message or an email, oh, goodness, I wonder what he's going to be talking about today. I want, I want them to anticipate when they pick up that phone, when they read that email, when they read that text message, that it's going to bring life to them. That's the kind of, kind of friendship that we're called to be. So what kind of friend are you? Now listen, a church as old as ours, we're blessed to have deep friendships. I look around this room and I know that there are people who have been friends for 20, 40 years. Let's, let's give thanks to the Lord for that, right? That is a gift from the Lord to have deep abiding friendships. Let's also remember that we have new people coming into our church who need those same kind of friendships. So let's not be so engrossed in our current friendships that we don't open the opportunity for new friendships to people who need it because people need refreshing friendships. Now, again, I, I want to say, you can't be friends with everybody. You can't have a thousand best friends. Okay, we get that. You can be friendly, 
You can't be best friends with a thousand people, but you can be best friends with someone. You can offer refreshing friendship to someone. Don't let the inability to do everything eclipse the possibility of blessing, to have meaningful, refreshing friendships for the glory of God. You need it. Fourthly, God's people discern spiritually. As a set-apart people, God's people live with gospel awareness given by the Holy Spirit. They seek to be spirit-led. Paul says that he cannot come to Corinth right now, and not just him, also Apollos, because a door has opened in Ephesus for the gospel. Verses 8 and 9. And then he says something interesting. Not only has a door opened for the gospel, there are also many adversaries working against us. And I've always found that combination really interesting whenever I'm reading through 1 Corinthians, that a door has opened for effective gospel work and... And there are many adversaries. You know, I think so often in life, we think that the first hiccup or any kind of resistance is a, a statement that God's not in it, right? Oh, there's resistance here, so God must not want to go here because if, if he was in it, it'd be open door after open door after open door, no resistance. But Paul saw something different and the power of the Spirit. And Acts chapter 19 is the result of his faithfulness. Listen to this. Because Paul stayed, because Paul engaged, and he, he discerned spiritually that, there was, that God was up to something. The Bible says in 19, Acts 19, verse 10, that all, A-L-L, all the residents of Asia, which is where Ephesus is, all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Can you imagine that? That a whole region of the world heard the gospel of Jesus Christ because Paul faithfully stayed. And here's what's incredible. There was so much power in the ministry of Paul there in Ephesus that people tried to mimic it. Mimic it. There, were, there were these um, itinerant Jewish exorcists. Can you imagine that title on a business card? I'm an itinerant Jewish exorcist. But that's what these people were. Itinerant, they went around, Jews casting out demons. And they saw the power of Paul. This guy had a handkerchief that touched his skin, touched his body, and they were able to use the handkerchief, the handkerchief of Paul, to go and heal somebody. Remarkable, right? That actually happened, though, in Acts 19. That actually happened. The, the handkerchief was used to heal somebody. And incredible, the kind of power. And so these itinerant Jewish exorcists, they see this handkerchief, they see this power, and they say, you know what? We want some of that. So let's go, let's start casting out demons in the name of Jesus. So they go up to this guy who's demon-possessed, and they say, hey, demons, get out of there in Jesus' name. And the demons say, who are you? And they say, well, it doesn't matter who we are. We're coming in the name of Jesus. And they said, well, Jesus, we know. We don't know you guys. So we're not doing anything but beating you up, taking your clothes off, and running you off naked. That's what happened to these itinerant Jewish exorcists. They went out of business because, because there was true power in the name of Jesus. Here's, what, here's what's incredible, too. That's not where it stopped. The gospel had such a profound effect in Ephesus. A riot, a riot was stirred up because... These craftsmen in Ephesus who made their living building idols for people to worship, false gods for people to worship, their business began to be affected. Lives were so changed, people quit worshiping false gods. The economy changed in Ephesus because of the work of Paul. Listen, church, do we live with this kind of awareness? Are we constantly asking God to show us where he is at work, experiencing God's style? God, where are you at work so I can join you, so that we can be used by him? Are we willing to stay or move based on God's calling on our lives to be ministers of the gospel, to not take any, any resistance we face as a closed door, but thinking, you know what? This may be the enemy wanting to stop something that God is in. And that we got to have discernment about how we move forward. We want what happened in Asia to happen in, in Raleigh, in North Raleigh. We want this area of our city that we believe God has entrusted to us, has given us responsibility for, to be saturated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for that to happen, it's going to take all of us living with spiritual discernment. Fifthly, God's people stand confidently. As a set-apart people, God's people develop a spirit-given confidence. We need to be confident in the Lord. 
We need to be strong in the Lord in order to continue to serve the Lord even when adversaries come, even when resistance come, just like Paul. Paul has reminded us over and over again that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle is taking place all around us. That's why he said how you deal with idolatry matters. Because it's not just the inanimate object idols. There's demonic activity going on that you've got to be aware of. He's also reminded us that the spiritual battle can have an effect on our unity as a church and our faithfulness to the gospel. And so because of that, verse 13, he says, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Paul's words here remind me of the the word that God gave to Joshua as he was going into the land of promise. Joshua 1, 9, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed because the Lord is with you. The Lord's your God. He's with you wherever you go. Joshua needed those words as he led the people of God into the land of promise. And we need those words to be faithful as his people today in a foreign land exiles, sojourners on our way to the new land of promise. Friends, we need to be on guard. We need to be alert to the work of the enemy. Have you ever had a a moment of discouragement in your life uh, or in, in the local church, a moment of division perhaps, and when you were able to get away and pray through it, you recognized the enemy was at work? That, that, that had to be the enemy trying to stop something that was clearly a move of God. We need those kinds of moments. We need that kind of discernment. We need to stand firm in the faith, persevering in the face of difficulty, remembering, as we've said, that resistance does not necessarily mean a door has closed. It may be a door God wants you to walk through and the enemy wants to stop. We need to act like men. What on earth does that mean, Jared? Well, in the language of the New Testament... It means to act with courage, to have confidence in the word of God, to have confidence in the will of God. And we need to be strong in the strength of the spirit, the strength that only the spirit can give. We need to live like we believe the promises of God. We need to live like anything that God gives to us is better than this world can offer, that his ways are better than the ways of this world. We need to live with that kind of confidence. And then finally, Paul says God's people are to love greatly. Paul balances his call to confidence and strength with a call to love in verse 14. The call to be tough, strong, is in no way a call to be mean or hard as the people of God. Quite the opposite. Because we love our brothers and sisters who are co-laborers in the gospel, whom we're connected in a deeply spiritual way, we work together. We're to be so affectionate with one another that we greet each other with a holy kiss. So turn to your neighbor and give them, I'm just kidding, don't do that. (laughs) Now be challenged. Do you love, do you love your brothers and sisters like that? Where you want to give them a big bear hug? Where you want to give them a big old kiss on the cheek and the glory of God? We love our partners around the world. And we want them to to know they're supported in the gospel work. And we love those who have not yet heard the gospel. We love them enough to tell them what's coming if they don't give their lives to Christ and Jesus. See, Paul doesn't just call the people in Corinth to live in this kind of love. He himself embodies it, as we see in verses 21 through 24. I love this part of the book. In this time, it wasn't uncommon for someone like Paul to have a secretary whom he would dictate his words to and they would write it down for him. But occasionally, if something was really important, they would take the pen up themselves and they would write it so that whoever they were writing to would know that this piece was really, really important. And that's what Paul does here. And what does he write? He wishes the grace of God upon them, but then he tells them how much He loves them. This is really important, guys. Paul was uncompromising in his his call to the church to stand firm in the gospel, to fix all the issues that were plaguing them. He called out their sin. He corrected what needed to be corrected, but he was not a jerk about it. 
His love for the Lord, his love for the word, his love for these people, it drove, it drove his strong words. He spoke the truth in love and he wants the church to know that. Listen, I know I've been tough. I know I've asked a lot of you, but I'm doing this because I love you. Hey, do we love in this way? Do we love our brothers and sisters enough to get in the mess of each other's lives to help stir them up to faithfulness? Because that's what we're called to do. We're called to be strong in the Lord, but we cannot lack love in doing so. Otherwise, our witness will be affected. Because remember, we are known by our love. What a vision of the church that, Paul's off, that Paul offers here. Who would not want to be a part of a church like this? What Christian wouldn't want to gather on the Lord's day with a generous, friendly, loving people who are actively seeking to walk in faithfulness and make much of Jesus? Oh, that those characteristics would be what we are known for, Bayleaf Baptist Church. How can we respond this morning? Let me just offer three responses to this compelling vision of the church that that Paul has offered us here. Firstly, would you receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul says in verse 23, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. What What a prayer for Paul to pray, knowing that his own words under the Spirit are a means of God's grace to communicate to us God's will for us as his people. Whether you know it or not, you gather with a group of people today who are declaring the grace of God to say God saved us radically in Jesus by allowing him to die in our place and raise him from the dead. And that's why we are here, to celebrate that. And if you've, if you've never received that incredible act of grace, this morning you are hearing it declared over you through the inspired words of Paul that is an act of grace from God on your behalf, and you have the opportunity to respond, to repent and believe in Jesus so that you can join this people so you can join this work and be a part of all that God is doing. If you've not been reconciled to the Lord, I just want to offer you today a moment to respond. Repent and believe in Jesus. We'll have some pastors here in the front in just a minute. We'd love to encourage you and pray with you if you need that this morning. Secondly, would you seek to live in greater set apartness? If you have received this grace of Jesus, and you recognize that you're called to the Lord, but you're also called to a people, would you seek to live in greater set-apartness? Seek to help us as Bailey Baptist Church faithfully offer this vision of the church that Paul has given to us. Let me ask you, as we walk through these six characteristics, are there, there, are there any of them that need to grow in your life? Because we collectively cannot be these six things if we individually are not these six things. So, Are you faithful to gather? Are you joyful in generosity? Are you a refreshing friend? Do you live with gospel awareness and sensitivity to the Spirit? Are you bold and willing to take? Are you willing to take gospel risk? Do you love? Do you love well? Do you love greatly? Just ask the Spirit to search your heart and to see if there's any place in your life where you need to grow and those characteristics of a faithful church. And finally, would you pray that God would use our set-apartness for his gospel purposes? Again, we want North Raleigh to be saturated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're asking God to use us to that end. And it's going to take us creating headlines like this, not the thing that normally is said of us, to show people the transformative light and power of the gospel. Oh, that we would be known, that we would be known to be like Jesus. Wherever you are, would you bow your heads? Ask God to help you know how to respond this morning again. If you've never given your life to Jesus, would you receive the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ today? by confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead to be saved so that you can celebrate what we declare today. 
Jesus is alive, and that changes everything. For the rest of us who have received this grace in Jesus, are these characteristics true of our lives? Are we living as a set-apart people, individually, corporately? Is there an area that needs to grow? And then, Father, we pray as a people that you would help us be set apart, but use our set-apartness to draw people to yourself as we faithfully declare the gospel in North Raleigh and to the ends of the earth. Help us respond in a way that helps us walk in greater faithfulness, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You stand and respond as the Lord leads. Thank you for joining us this week at Bayleaf. For more information about Bayleaf Baptist Church, visit our website at bayleaf.org.